In this podcast, I want to spend some time talking about uh, some of the answers from the first exam. Um, I want to just go over some of the uh, the finer details. Uh, there's obviously a lot more uh, that would go into the answers um, that you would provide, um, but I wanted to give you just uh, the gist of uh, the solutions for each of these. So question number one was on um, SVN and sort of this idea of, you know, what was, what's the process that you actually use uh, in order to add a project to SVN? And there's actually two important pieces, um, you know, in addition to, you know, finding the actual uh, repository location and typing in names and all, all that. Uh, but there's, uh, the first part is making sure that you actually share the project. Um, and within Eclipse, uh, of course, you ha would have to right click on the project and, and find um, share. Uh, but uh, more importantly, um, beyond all of that, is making sure that you actually commit the files. Um, and that will then ensure that uh, your project is being fully controlled by SVN so that any modifications you make will be captured um, by the, uh, or, or within the repository. So the uh, second question was uh, the purpose of the, the setup method. And uh, uh, the thing that, um, was important here was making sure that uh, uh, you indicated that this is an operation that was done commonly across all of the different uh, test cases that are executed. Uh, the setup uh, essentially uh, establishes whatever preconditions uh, you want to establish for um, the, um, the class that you're testing. So <clears throat> it, is, uh, it is a method that's executed again prior to every test case. Uh, and these are usually common setup operations. Uh, the third question was on CPP unit um, and the assert and assert equals. Uh, the first one is a more general assertion and so you can take any Boolean value, any Boolean expression and provide that to assert and as long as that expression ends up evaluating the true, uh, the CPP unit assert will pass. Uh, the CPP unit assert equals takes two values, <coughs> checks to see whether or not they're the same. One, the first one is the ex ex expected value. Uh, the second uh, value is the actual value that is computed by the program. Okay, so the uh, the next question, um, there's a question about the uh, the tool chain and and what you need to do. For that, um, so answering so the program will compile correctly wasn't a sufficient answer, and there were actually a couple of people that did answer that. Um, there's a number of different reasons. One of them, uh, most importantly, is making sure that the proper compilers are used by Eclipse. Um, different hardware architectures, so depending on whether or not you're on Windows or Linux or Mac or whatever, require different compilers. Uh, the same compiler does not work across all of the different systems, so. C++ is not Java, and you know, jo within Java you have these virtual machines and the compilers are pretty much the same, so you never have to set the tool chain within Eclipse because uh, all of that is done uh, on top of this, uh, this virtual machine architecture that uh, Eclipse uses. Well, uh, sorry, yeah, Eclipse plus Java. Um, but with C++, uh, you do have to be mindful of your uh, of your architecture. So if I'm running on Linux, it uses a whole different set of compilers. The binaries that get generated are different. Um, and so I can't just compile on Linux and expect it to run in Windows and vice versa. I can't compile something in Windows and expect it to run in Linux. And so I, I do have to make sure that I um, define which tool chain is being used uh, in the project so that the, the architecture is targeted properly. <coughs> So there was also a question here about um, why it's necessary to use pointers. Uh, there's actually a number of different reasons, um, you know, things like more efficient use of memory. Uh, you want to be able to expand the scope of a variable beyond local scope. Uh, doing pointer arithmetic and uh, other object management is necessary um, or maybe more convenient, I guess, uh, with, uh, with pointers. So accessing the data may be more uh, convenient uh, if you're using pointers, um, because using uh, pointer arithmetic and so forth. 
Um, there's also um, this idea that uh, uh, you want to be able to pass objects to different functions and methods. And um, if you uh, need to make a modification to the object, <coughs> uh, a regular value won't work. And so using a pointer or using a reference object uh, uh, may be called for. And so it's another convenient place or another place, another reason you might want to use a pointer. It's because you want to make a modification to an object through a method call. Okay, so uh, definition of big O, that was pretty straightforward. I think a lot of people just took that straight off of their, uh, straight off of their, uh, their note sheet. Um, basically, big O says that if you have functions f and g, uh, function f is big O of g if, uh, uh, <coughs> if there's, uh, if, sorry, if f of n is less than or equal to c times g of n for n greater than or equal to um, some constant n, and c is some arbitrary constant. So uh, some rationale as to why we want to uh, use big O uh, and some examples. I, um, I didn't provide an example here. Actually, people gave uh, several examples. Um, but uh, you know, essentially, we want to know whether or not our algorithms are better, worse, or the same as other algorithms. <coughs> And uh, especially, you know, with respect to running time and memory usage. So, um, so if uh, an algorithm runs in big O of n, then I know that the algorithm is linear and, the, and it will run in linear time with respect to input size. Uh, and so, you know, we try to use big O then to, to characterize uh, how well our functions are going to run. Um, you know, how, how good of an algorithm is it? Uh, so. Uh, you know, doing things like a, a linear search versus a binary search. Binary search is faster, so I can use big O. If I, you know, just come up with some algorithm, I can show that the algorithm is either linear or it is, it is um, or sublinear. And so I want to be able to use big O basically to, to prove that. So if I come up with some brand new algorithm that, you know, does things much better than other algorithms, I need to be able to um, prove to people that, that's true. I can't just run a bunch of data and say, okay, see, uh, no, you actually you know, have a way of actually proving that now using big O. So uh, characterize the algorithm, show that it runs through proof, show that it runs uh, or will execute uh, uh, in your target uh, running time. So uh, there was a question here about uh, proving that if I have some constant c, um, for any constant c, that uh, c to the n uh, to the k is big O of n to the k. So um, using, uh, probably using this, uh, this constant c will, could have been a little bit uh, misleading um, because then you have to reorient the way you do the function because we typically talk about the sum constant c being in the definition. So I use c1 there. So I let c1 equal 1, uh, rewrite, the, uh, rewrite the function uh, description. Um, so if I'm proving big O, I want to show that um, c n to the k is less than or equal to, and now I'm going to choose some other constant c1 into the k, well, I can just set c equal, uh, or c1 equal whatever this constant c is. Um, then I get uh, c times n to the k less than or equal to c times n to the k. And these cancel out. The n to the k's cancel out. This is just, you know, then true for, for all n. Uh, try to get at some of the uh, the reasoning behind this uh, an example so if I have uh, 2 times n to the some constant let me say 7 <coughs> well this is this function is ba or this uh, statement here is basically being used to show you that well if I have whatever some constant is in front of this I will always know that this function is big O n to the 7 right uh, and so <clears throat> We've basically proven that, you know, whatever constant we have out in front, whatever arbitrary constant it is, uh, that uh, the function is always big O of whatever is um, <clears throat> on the, uh, the, 
this other part of the product. So anyway, uh, I think that we saw uh, several, there's several examples where we see this kind of thing uh, within uh, the problems that we were doing. Okay, so question number uh, nine was to prove that uh, 7n cubed plus 3n plus 1 is big of n cubed over 3. This is a fairly straightforward problem. You just break it down into the three different parts of the, uh, of the, um, of the expression. Prove that each one of them is uh, big of n cubed over 3, uh, and then apply a property to. So um, I'm not going to do the problem here. All right, so next question was, uh, or the next few questions were based on using um, this code here for uh, midterm class. And um, you know, there's a number of different features here that uh, you wanted to pay attention to. Um, there were um, some friend functions here. Um, this uh, had a private um, attribute of string. Uh, there were two methods that were used to generate strings, and um, you see here that in line 17 to 26, we have the, uh, the friend functions. And then at the bottom is, a, uh, is the code for a constructor. So uh, with this in mind, there were a couple of questions. Uh, the first question was, uh, what is the effect of calling do something zero versus calling do something one. And going back to uh, looking at the actual code, <coughs> you see here that uh, do something one, uh, you pass a reference, uh, whereas, sorry, do something zero passes a reference, whereas do something one uh, passes a value. Well, um, that of course has significant uh, uh, a significant impact on the problem because any changes that are done uh, in uh, this <coughs> part of the code uh, will not actually uh, have an effect outside of the scope of this, whereas uh, this, uh, this method, do something zero, uh, does have a side effect and it's actually a desirable side effect. So. <coughs> Uh, since uh, do something one uses pacify value, nothing will be printed in line four. The call to do something zero will result in printing there. The next question was uh, to basically write um, a print operation. Uh, we've seen this actually since the exam. We've seen this several times. Uh, you define your uh, your friend operator, uh, and then in line. Um, find your print function. The, uh, the next question was, um, it's a multiple answer question. Uh, you had to check each correct answer and then indicate for each one of them uh, why it was equivalent uh, or not. Um, some of you didn't provide answers for some of these. I mean, you left it blank and so you didn't receive an answer for them or didn't receive points for them. Um, <coughs> So both C and D are correct here, and uh, so that's uh, both of these were correct. First two are, are not correct. Uh, let's think about uh, these a little bit as to why they are or are not correct. So A plus I, um, that gives us the address of of uh, of uh, so the array, um, let me draw the array here. So this will give me the ith location of the array. Uh, so maybe that's my i. Uh, and then it says from there get, uh, um, get my string. Um, but uh, the, uh, what you actually have to do is dereference um, the actual object at that location before you can actually call that. Um, so that would not be equivalent to what is done here in the uh, uh, in the uh, 
the statement above. So you're missing a dereference with this one. Uh, here in question number B, it's first dereferencing A and then adding I to that, uh, which uh, actually doesn't make any sense. Uh, what does I plus whatever the object actually mean? So that, uh, that also is incorrect. Uh, in this, uh, in, in part C, uh, you see that uh, you've got the, uh, the ith object is being, uh, is being dereferenced, and then, uh, and then we're doing a, um, uh, doing a call to get my string. Um, so, uh, that uh, that is actually what is desired here uh, because we've got again you know with this piece here we're dereferencing that's these two pieces are equivalent right so you either uh, you can either use a of i or you can use the pointer or sorry the dereference of a plus i so that gives us this piece of the um, uh, of the statement and then we dereference it again uh, which gives us the other portion of the uh, of the expression, um, so that's correct. <coughs> and then finally, um, the last one was a little more tricky. Um, you've got a uh, well, so we want to know what the uh, address of a is, uh, so that uh, gives us the uh, the pointer or the address of of the a. Um, uh, the a pointer and then we add we add i to it oh so we do reference it and then we add i to it so that is actually the same thing as doing what we have here uh, and then we do uh, so we've dereferenced uh, whatever is at a and then we've added i to it so that gives us our a plus i now we do reference it twice so that ends up being the same as uh, the previous uh, answer Okay, so uh, question number uh, 13. Um, this actually, there's a, a, a fairly fortuitous thing here for most of you, actually all of you, uh, because of the ordering. Um, but uh, there's a couple of things you have to actually pay attention to here. Um, and it just kind of worked out here that uh, you can get the answer to this by just going through uh, and doing uh, uh, doing everything in order. So a boolean is one byte, a character uses one byte. Uh, so we have boolean and character. So each of those is one byte. And I don't actually need to worry about uh, boundaries for these because they're not larger than integers. I don't need to worry whether or not it, it falls on a boundary. Um, but then uh, we, have, uh, <clears throat> uh, we have a string here and then two doubles and so this this string pointer uh, is going to use uh, four bytes uh, each of these uh, each of these doubles uses eight bytes and then we have this integer that uses four bytes we do have a virtual here that also uses four bytes uh, and then we have these two the boolean and the character use one byte each but then you have to put these paddings in here to make sure that everything falls within the uh, uh, within the integer boundary, so these two would be unused. We get a four, get two eights, <coughs> then a four and a four. Uh, so looking at uh, uh, looking at this, then we have uh, four plus four. That's eight. Eight plus uh, uh, eight plus the sixteen is twenty-four. Uh, plus another 8 is our 32, 32 bytes. Um, now, had uh, had we done had this ordering been a little bit different, um, uh, you know, we may have had to worry about uh, um, these things not following falling on uh, different boundaries. You have they would have to be adjacent, uh, for instance, in order for us to have. Um, uh, our most compact usage of this data structure. And then again, remember that a virtual uh, does require, uh, uh, th what this ends up doing is uh, storing an address of uh, the virtual operation to be actually executed. Um, and that's all 
due to how uh, how inheritance works uh, within C++. So anyway, the uh, the answer is 32 bytes. Um, so any answer answer of how these things are are um, <coughs> are ordered is acceptable as long as the uh, uh, as long as the boolean and the character are adjacent. Now I think there are a number of people that uh, got uh, confused. I think by uh, uh, this piece here it says a character to represent the root name and then they define a character for every single one of these but there's only one character there's only one root name for any given route so um, you no need to have a different character for each one um, so anyway <coughs> the um, uh, the optimal answer really or one of the optimal answers for definition of this class would be uh, to have all of these uh, these attributes, uh, whatever in whatever order they were specified in the statement, uh, so boolean character, uh, pointer for the string, two doubles, and the integer. Okay, so uh, the next question was to uh, draw a picture um, that shows how. Uh, memory is structured after the execution of the stop constructor. So after the execution, um, <coughs> that means that uh, this uh, uh, this operation is done executing, uh, and um, that uh, if you notice here that writer factory uh, is a pointer creates a new writer factory object, but there is no delete here, uh, which actually means that. Uh, once the scope of this uh, this operation is done, uh, we lose the handle to this writer factory object. Um, so we're going to have a writer factory object here somewhere. Um, so I'm going to call it uh, writer factory. And initially, it's RF pointing to this uh, to this object, but that actually goes away. So that after we're done, uh, we have some ran some object that's just out there in memory. Um, the other piece here is that uh, we have um, this uh, uh, this writer's object, and there was a handout that you got along with the exam um, that showed that uh, that writers was an attribute of the stop object, and now it's pointing to an integer of uh, uh, sorry, an array of integers. So, we have this writers pointing to this array, and it has four items in it. Um, so you can assume that there was four four items, and then um, the <coughs> uh, the writer factory is going to generate writers that are going to then be stored in each one of those array locations. So uh, you can have then four different writer objects that uh, this array points to. Okay, so that's probably the most basic picture that you could draw here. Um, there's really no need to have any of the other details because uh, uh, we're only interested in, in the um, how the memory is structured. Um, I indicated here that you don't have to show values of in individual primitive types, uh, rather just focus on the pointer types. Here are the pointer types. So you have this array of integers and each one of those points, each of those integers is pointing to a different writer object. I think some of you overthought this problem um, and had all sorts of data and everything listed in here, but really, I mean, this is the most basic way to draw this. Again, you had to also pick out this fact that writer factory, you know, it's just some object and it's it's no longer uh, referred to at the end of this, so it's just out there uh, without any handle. Okay, and then uh, the last question is um, this code fragment. Uh, you have to be careful here uh, because the way that the code is is tabbed and everything has an impact on readability, and it, but it also uh, 
does not have effect on an effect on what's actually executed. So uh, you see here that uh, we've got this uh, piece that's indented, but there's no, it doesn't mean that when you hit the else that you execute both of those. Uh, the other thing you had to pay attention to here is this n equals zero. Um, that's actually a valid thing to do. You could say if n equals zero, so you're assigning zero to the uh, variable n. Um, and so that's going to actually end up being true. It's going to execute n is 0. And then it's going to skip over this and then execute the square of n is, and then whatever n time is, n is actually 0. So <clears throat> that's the, those are the things that are going to be executed and printed. So you're going to get n is 0. You're going to get the square of n is, is 0. getting lazy here. <clears throat> so how do you correct this? Well, that's probably what was intended here. I don't know anybody that actually does this uh, where they don't intend to actually check the value. And then uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, you have, you know, if it is zero, then you're going to print this. If it's not zero, you can print this. And then uh, you probably wanted to have either this piece of it indented back here. Um, or if the intention, you know, and you could have assumed this, uh, was to actually execute both of these, which I think by the indentation is what they meant, um, is to have the curly braces there. Uh, so when it is not zero, then you print that the square of it is whatever the, whatever the value is squared. Okay, so anyway, that is the, um, uh, those are the, uh, answers to that uh, that first example.